we're going to read this, and then I want you, how many of you are, Brother Greg, you found Joel 2 and 2? You say Job or Joel? Joel. Joel. Oh. Joel. Joel's 2 and 2, whoever has that. And uh, Revelation, the 6th chapter, verse 1. Let me read this here as we're waiting for those. Pimace. Pimace. Day. Okay. Adelphoi. Luke. Este. And Scote. Hina. Hey, Chimera. Himas. Hos. Kleptes. Karalabe. All right. But ye, brothers, not ye are in darkness. In order that the day ye as the thief, it shall overtake you. All right. The day as a thief shall overtake you. A lot of wrongdoing takes place in the night and under cover of darkness. And it's always been that way since the beginning of time. Uh, thieves uh, slip around and sneak around in the night and under the cover of lies and darkness. And false religion is like darkness, isn't it? False religion is like darkness because it keeps people in darkness. In John, the third chapter, it says the light came in the world, but the doctrine of darkness would not receive it. And here we have the same figure of speech used in this verse here. Now Joel 2 and 2. Who has Joel 2 and 2? Brother Greg. Yeah. <clears throat> a day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and thick darkness. As the dawn is spread over the mountains, so there is a great and mighty people. There is There has never been anything like it, nor will there be again after it. To the, to the years of many generations. All right. It's talking about calamity. And it's also, he's quoting the book of Enoch. He's quoting Enoch, because Jude also quoted Enoch when he talked about the thick darkness. Now, darkness is not only just dark. It is lies. In the Bible, when it talks about darkness so many times, in John the third chapter where it's talking about darkness, scote, or scotios, it's not talking about dark the absence of light, but is talking about the darkness of false religious systems. The darkness of lies. Revelation 6 and 1, we have an ultimate liar on the scene. An ultimate liar on the scene. Revelation 6 and 1. Who has Revelation 6 and 1? All right, Terry. Revelation 6 and 1. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. And I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come. All right. The Lamb opens up these seals. Now, what he's opened up here is not really a seal, as you would think it today. What he's talking about here is a book. And this book is a scroll. It is a scroll. Let me draw a picture up here for you. My poor drawing. But the word Biblia, or Biblios, is a book. But it's not a book like we look at a book today, like the, any book that you would have in here, like any Bible. It was a scroll. And back in those days, they sealed things with wax. And they would put a signet ring in it. Now, when they would roll the scroll up, okay, and when it gets so far... It would be rolled up to here, okay? And they would take a gob of wax or clay or something and put it right on there and roll it and smash it in there and they'd seal it. And they'd take it and roll it a little further and then they'd put a gob of, the gob of wax and seal it. And that's how the seals that's talking about in this book, all right? He broke the seals. He opened the book a little bit further. He turned the page, in other words. Okay, does that help you understand that a little bit? Revelation 6 and 1, you read that one? Revelation 6 and 2. Brother Greg, have you got Revelation 6 and 2 there? But you ought to cross-reference this right to this verse right here, because this is very, very important. 
uh, Revelation 6 and 2? Yes. I looked and behold a white horse, and he who sat on on it had had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. All right. Movies have been made about this verse. Books have been written about this verse. A million sermons have been written or, or preached about this verse that you hear right now. And it all comes right across with what we see here right here. That is a great period of darkness when this happens. This great period of darkness takes place right prior to and beginning in the tribulation period that you see on your little maps here, tribulation map, right at the end of the church age. Okay? Now this person comes up here and he's on a white horse. What does white mean? When you when you wave a white flag, what happens? Surrender. You surrender or give in. You give in or Peace. Peace. Peace, peace. Andrew Jackson was president of the United States. And during his term, he told his warriors, his captains, his generals, his colonels, I want you to go down into Florida and all through the Creek Nation and the Sauk and the Fox Nation, and I want you to either kill every Indian down there. I don't want any of them left alive. And if any of them are alive, they just totally surrender. It's up to you whether you kill them or not. I don't care whether they're on a white flag, man, woman, child, or animal. It doesn't make it to kill them. If you see in your heart mercy at all and they don't show you any resistance, you can either shoot them or else take them and put them in jail and we're going to ship them to Indian Territory. <coughs> well, many times when they came out, the Indians came out and they would say that they wanted to meet with them because these people were hard to catch. These were Indians in the forest and in the deep in the swamps and everything else. And they said, well, we want to meet with you and talk treaty terms with them. Well, when they get out there, they either shoot them down. It didn't matter. Some of the people in the United States government started finding out about this. And they started protesting uh, Andrew Jackson's uh, actions against these people that were the indigenous, the Native American people here that he was murdering to take their lands. They said, there's no way you can do that under uh, guise of peace or whatever. It's wrong. You can't make right out of it. Well, here we have another person like that. He comes on the world. Now, who is the Antichrist? This is the Antichrist. What does the word Antichrist mean? What does it mean? The opposite, the, opposite. the opposites are against. Anti. That means against. Okay? Or instead of. Alright. Instead of. And then we have the word Christ. What does the word Christ mean? It comes from the Greek word Christos. Which comes from the Hebrew word Messiah. Alright? The root of the Greek form is krail, which means to pour oil upon. The word Messiah means to anoint or to be picked out, to be appointed. Okay? Now, the Bible talked about Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22. The Bible te talks about the Messiah of Israel, that he would be sent to Israel and that they would not hear him. Jesus said in John 3rd chapter, as we're talking about in this verse here, he said, the light came into darkness, but the darkness would not receive him at all. The Messiah came. For 2,000 years, the Jewish world has said that they are not guilty of the blood of the Messiah. But you read the Gospels. The Gospels are the inspired account of what happened. There are historical accounts of what happened at that very time. What did Israel do? What did the leaders of Israel do when, when Pilate demanded that they turn Jesus free? What did Israel do? The Roman government declared him innocent. What did Israel do? They demanded his death. And they said, let his blood be what? Upon us and our children. 
when Pilate washed his hands in the... He said, I am innocent of this man's blood. And they said, let his blood be upon us and our children. Let his blood be upon us and our children. Over and over again, they were shouting and roaring, and the foundations of the very basilica was shaking with their stomping feet and their yelling voices. Revelation 6 and 2. Now read on again. Here we have this, this great man on a white horse, a horse uh, that typifies peace. He's got a bow in his hand that typifies the ability to make war, and he's got a crown on his head which typifies that he is the anointed one. Every king, every queen is anointed. Did you know that? When Queen Elizabeth was crowned queen, she was anointed with oil and crowned. She was the anointed one. She is the anointed one of England or Great Britain. She is the anointed one. She is the crowned princess of England. All right? Now, here we have a crowned prince. He comes in on the statutes, the platform of peace and safety, and to bring the world that is in an absolute uproar with shenanigans being pulled from the top to the bottom of all the world. We've got a divided world, and he's going to bring the world back to peace. Go ahead, Brother Greg, 6 and 3. When he broke the second seal, I heard, I heard the second living creature saying, Come. Okay, hold on right there. Okay. What did he do? He unrolled the book a little bit further, didn't he? And he broke another seal. Next page is what he said. Go ahead. I heard a living creature. A living. It, it actually shouldn't be living creature. It should be living being. A living being. All right. And another, a red horse went out. Okay. A yep. sorrow horse. A sorrow horse. What do you think that means? A red horse. Yeah. Blood. Bloodshed. Now he changed from peace to bloodshed. When you get peace, he's going to say, if, you're going to, if I'm going to give you peace, you're going to have to give me tremendous power. I'm going to have to bring all the criminals and all the uh, anarchists under my control. This man that tried to shoot uh, Teddy Roosevelt in 1912 was an anarchist. He didn't believe that anybody ought to be a ruler over anything or ought to be a leader. And people ought to just be doing their own thing. Everything, there shouldn't be laws, there shouldn't be any judges, there shouldn't be any governors or anything. Well, President Teddy Roosevelt, he was actually running for president then. He was, making, he was going to make a speech, and this man slipped up and shot him. Old Teddy Roosevelt was a tough man. Real tough. He had his glasses, like I have, usually in his pocket when he wasn't reading or trying to see somebody. And he had them in a steel metal case, and he had a 50-page speech that he was going to give, this campaign speech. And he folded that campaign speech and stuck it in his glass case and stuck it in his shirt pocket. This guy shot him, and the bullet went right through that. It was a 38 caliber bullet, this anarchist. And he went right through there, and he went ahead and went and entered his body. Teddy Roosevelt was a tough man. But he wouldn't go to the doctor because, he, because doctors had killed three presidents that had been assassinated were shot before they died of a bad doctor. He wouldn't go. Not only wouldn't he go, but he went ahead and spoke for 50 minutes with his blood running out of his body. He, shoot. he said it takes more than one bullet to kill a bull moose candidate. <laughs> Finally, he went to bed that night and they took him off to Chicago on a train. When he got up, he went to the hospital the next day and let him clean him up. Well, the anarchist. This man was an anarchist. And the United States passed a law after that that anybody that was a known anarchist could not come into the country. They had to be stopped. Throw them off the books. You're not welcome. Because this guy was a Polish. He was from Poland. And he was an anarchist. And so they wouldn't let people. If they were a known anarchist or any, any affiliation with that part of party of these people that were anarchists, they couldn't come into the United States. They'd throw them off the boat. And they had cartoon pictures of throwing them off the boats before they got to a... To a 
New York. Go ahead, Brother Greg. So this man's going to stop all anarchy. A red horse went out, and to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth. And that, and that man would slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. All right. So now we have this man that's going to bring peace and safety to the world, but before he can bring peace and safety, he's given a lot of authority to do what? To kill all of the opposition. Now the rapture has already come. God's people have already been caught up from the earth. There's probably a large revival that has taken place because Uncle Jane and Aunt Paul and whoever, brothers and sisters, are left behind and <coughs> the relatives have gone to be with the Lord. And the relatives have been telling them, I hope they've been telling them about the Lord's coming all the time. So when they're raptured and they're taken away, all that's left on the earth is lost people. Except what happened outside of the Noah's Ark. What happened on the outside of Noah's Ark when it started raining? Still banging on the door. There was a great revival taking place outside the ark. It's too late. Too late. One raindrop, too late. <coughs> it had never rained on the earth before. But when it started raining and, and the, the, the oceans of the sky started pouring down the earth and the the, the fountains of the deep were coming up and flooding the earth. These people were out there crying and bawling and wanting to repent. But they got to die. They didn't get on the ark. There's going to be people that are saved after the rapture, but they're, they have missed the boat, so to speak. They've missed the ark. They've missed Christ. They're going to have to die. Remember, as we see this, we're going to find out how horrible it's going to be on this earth. Six and three, Bert and brother. When he when he broke the second seal, I heard a second living creature saying, "Come." Did I read? I already read that. Yeah. Six and three. Uh -huh. Six and five. Yeah. Or, four or four. Uh, that was. Now wait a minute. They all start the same way. Uh, Every seal I believe six and five. Yeah. Okay. When he broke the third seal, I I heard a third living creature saying, "Come." I looked and behold a black horse. Okay, and he, now we have a white horse, we have a red horse, and now we have a black horse. And he who sat, sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. All right, now let's hold on right there before we go any further. We've had the red horse, I mean the white horse, which was peace and safety. We have a red horse where he starts killing. And then the third horse is black. Black means what? Death, destruction, and darkness. Okay. White, remember that. Red and black horses. These horses typify something. These are figures of speech. All right, go ahead, brother. Now he has scales in his hand. Now what do you think scales represent? Justice. What? Justice. Well, that's all justice in his hands, but all weights and measures and all economy. This man is the economic controller of the earth. Nobody can buy or sell at all. Go ahead, brother. And I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius. And do not damage the oil and the wine. All right, we got a quart of wheat for one denarius. Let's translate that to, to the today's, today's terms, wages. okay? A day's, wages. a day's wages. Remember, I told you in 1900 when Teddy Roosevelt came to power. There were a lot of movements among the people. At that period of time in America, it took the mother, it took the father, and every child in the family above the age five to work to just put food on the table. That's what it took. It took everybody in the family above the age of five to be work eight 
to 12 hour, 15 hour, 16 hour days sometimes just to put food on the table. A day's wages. Now how much is a quart of wheat? A quart, is that what it says, a quart of wheat? Yeah, a quart of wheat. How much is a quart of wheat? Canaries. Well, no, how much is a quart of wheat? A quart jar, all right, of wheat. Now, I want you to think about something else now for a while. When you grind that wheat in the flour, it makes a lot of difference. It's ground down fine. And what do you do with the flour? A quart of wheat won't even make a loaf of bread. Did you know that? A day's wages won't even buy a loaf of bread. Not wheat bread. Now, the next term, brother. A quart of wheat for a denarius and, a, and three quarts of barley for a denarius. All right. Three quarts of barley. Three quarts of barley for a day's wages. Now that was <clears throat> the ration. Three quarts of barley would make a loaf of barley bread. That's cheap, cheap flour is what it is. Three quarts of barley ground up would make a loaf of bread. And that was a prisoner's ration. Think about that. A prisoner could subsist on that. Three quarts of barley, which would make a loaf of bread if it was ground. Now, back in ancient Egypt, they could tell very easily when they did autopsies on a body, a mummy, to tell whether it was wealthy or poor. There was two classes in Egypt. There was the rich and the poor. All right? This man, there is going to be two classes in the world, the rich and the poor. There will be no middle class whatsoever at all. He's going, to, he's going to do away with the middle class. They could tell very easily in Egypt who was the poor man and who was the rich man. Because the poor man's teeth would be ground off eating poor food. He had to chew a lot. He ate barley. That's what he ate, barley. Barley with chips of Unclean, what do you think? Sand. Sand will wear your teeth now, you know that? Because it's harder than your teeth. So their teeth would be worn down in the book. And many people, uh, before 1900, many, many people, the reason why they died was bad teeth. So in the beginning, in the 1800s, when you got 25 years old, they'd pull all your teeth out. So you'd live a little longer, so you wouldn't get poisoned to death by abscesses. Well, here we are, going back into history. But we're looking ahead. This hasn't happened yet. Go ahead, brother. The fourth seal, death. When the Lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come. I looked and, and beheld an ashen horse, and he who sat on it had a, had a name, Death, and Hades was following with him. Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with a sword, with famine, and with pestilence, and by the wild beasts of the earth. All right. Now the next person is on a pale green horse. Pale green. Why in the world is it called a pale green horse? It's called a pale horse in the book of Revelation, in the King James called Ashen Horse there. How many of you, <coughs> probably hardly anyone here, have any of you ever seen somebody that was dead that was not involved? That had been dead for a day or two? All right. What color were they? Purple. Kind of purple. Blood the, green still, the, the blood had come to his yeah. skin. Yeah, it was healed in her body. Pretty ugly. <laughs> It's, it's, a, it's a kind of a blackish, greenish, yeah. ashen color. That's the color of this one. There's a lot of dead people in the world at this time. A lot of people that aren't even buried. 
no barriers. Community barriers. When the uh, city pool was taken to the Standing Rock Indian Reservation, he was told by the United States government when he was in Canada he escaped out of here, one never going to come back to the United States. So he said, "You people are a bunch of liars down there." He said, "You never have told anything." And, and one, one general came up here and talked to him and told him, you know, said him, well, if you'll just come back and go back to your land, we'll deal with you, we'll treat you with you, we're not going to imprison you, we're not going to do anything, we just want you to come back and represent your people because you're the chief. He said, my people are with me, and he said, you're liars, and you brought your lies back up here with you, take your lies back down there, because I don't believe a word you say. Well, he found out that a lot of people were starving to death, and, and, and some messengers had of his own people that got up there and his people were starving to death and the United States government would not even allow them to eat. They wouldn't give them any rations. And they were starving down there. And they were begging Setting Bull to come. So after four years, Setting Bull finally came back. In the meanwhile, there was a Paiute medicine man up in Nevada and he started a religion among the Indians. That was kind of like the book of Revelation. He had known the church. And he heard about the resurrection. And he heard about the Lord coming by. He said, you know something? He said, God gave him a vision. And he says, we're going to get and we're going to dance. And at the Indians dancing, when you go around in a circle and you sing, they're singing prayers. That's what they're doing. They're going around and saying their prayers. And they're praying to God. That's what all these Indian dances are. They're prayers. That's what they are. So they got out there and they did what they called the ghost dance, which was the resurrection dance. That's what it actually was. And they would put on special shirts and with birds and buffalo on them and different things. And they would pray that God would resurrect the fallen Indian leaders and that he would resurrect the buffalo and that if all the Indians came back and they were resurrected and all the buffalo were back because the United States government had decided to annihilate the buffalo. If they could kill the food of the Indians, then they could control them because they would be starving to death. And they gave all the money they could give to anybody, any buffalo hunter could get all the free cartridges he had if he'd just go out and shoot buffalo. So from 1800 to 1880, from 100 million buffalo, there was down to just a few hundred. They were going to bring them to extinction because they, then they could control the Indians and they would be pawns in their hands. Well, Setting Bull went back to the Standing Rock Reservation and, and a woman came there to him and, and tried to get him to go out with her and to campaign among the cities. She was a, a, a freedom and, and civil rights leader. And she said, they have done your people, and your people wrong, and they are taking your land, and let's go out and bring it to the American public. Let's let it be known. Well, he wouldn't do it. He said, no. He said, I don't want to leave my people. He said, I'm afraid they'll do them wrong if, if, I, if I'm not here, because if I'm here, I am so important that whatever I tell them, they will stand behind me. They can't rip them off. And she said, you can do more purpose, more good for your people out speaking and letting the American public know what's happening to here on the reservation. There were prisons. And he was a prisoner, and they wouldn't let him go anyway. Well, they decided to arrest him because they had started this ghost dance there among the Lakota, this resurrection dance. And he had gone, and he listened to this, and he went back home, and he said, No, this is not going to be this easy. He said, God told me when he, he said we were going to win the battle. We, we thought we won the war with Custer and, and with uh, Crook and all of them. We whipped them all, but they just kept coming. He said, it's not going to be this easy. Maybe, he said, God will help us one of these days. But right now, this isn't the answer. Well, because he went to the ghost dance, they decided to arrest him because they thought he was going to lead the people. And all the ghost dance was, was a religious revival, praying that God would resurrect the dead. They arrested and murdered him. And it just swept and scared the, the Lakota people, the Sioux people, scared them to death. He was the greatest leader among them, the greatest 
he wasn't so much a war leader but a preacher he was a minister he was a reverend to them he was a great medicine man and here their leader their pipeline to God was gone so they got scared to death they went out there and they started praying harder than they ever prayed before and they went out there with a whole bunch of soldiers with these Hotchkiss guns and cannons and Gatling guns and surrounded these Indians, man, women, and children. That's what they call a wounded knee, the battle of wounded knee. These people were dancing and singing and praying. And the soldiers got around and they were going to arrest them. But they also told the man, and this is a, have you ever, how many of you seen the movie Hidalgo? That's about it. Yeah. This, that was about it. By the way, that's part of our family. The dog was. Or not the horse, but the guy. He was in. He was Lakota. <coughs> and the message was, arrest these people or kill them. It's up to you. That's the message that he took to them. He didn't know it was in the paper. They went out there and they just literally mowed these people down. Bigfoot was in that, in that bunch. That was a, he, was a, he was a leader. They were underneath a flag of truce and under a, an American flag when that took place. And they killed every one of them and took a big open grave and threw their bodies in it because it, it had frozen. They were frozen in grotesque different gestures. And you can see that in many, many history books. That was called the Battle of Wounded Knee. There wasn't any battle to it. It was just a massacre. But that was supposed to make up for the Battle of the Little Bighorn, which didn't even take place. The Battle of Little Bighorn was called Custer's Last Stand. Custer wasn't alive. He was dead already. A little Indian boy by the name of White Bull had killed him when they came in to murder all the people in the Lakota camp. This little boy grabbed a rifle and shot Custer off his horse. They grabbed him, took off, and that was not Custer's Last Stand. But when they were surrounded, because they were going to go in and annihilate the Indians. So Wounded Knee was a counterpart to... Custer's last name. Here we have it again in the book of Revelation. We have that kind of, of killing, that kind of murderous attitude. Just kill anybody that opposes me. And don't even give them a burial. Just throw them out there in a common grave. Just get them so they don't stink. Just throw them in a ditch. Don't involve them. Don't give them a burial. Just roll them over in a ditch and cover them up. That's what that's talking about there. That pale horse, that pale green horse, that death horse. The horse of death. Go on, brother. When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar of the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. All right, hold on right there. Who are these? Who are these martyrs? Christians. Christians. When did they get killed? <clears throat> By the death horse. The death horse had killed them and murdered them. And their souls are with God in heaven. The Mormons have seven years of provisions. And they put a lot of stock in gold and silver. But you cannot work without the mark of the beast. You cannot buy a loaf of bread with money, gold or silver at all. And if you have any possessions, they're going to be taken from you and you're going to be put in work camps all over the world. This is what we call complete control by the Antichrist. The false Messiah of Israel, and he will probably be a Jew because Israel will not accept anyone but a Jew for to be their Messiah. Go on, brother. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who, who dwell on the earth? And, and there was given to each, to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer while the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were who were 
who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed also. All right. Let me tell you a little bit about the scene of the world. Public executions are going to be very common. They're going to go from city to city, and they're going to completely control the city. And anybody that objects, or anyone that will not take the mark of the beast, these are Christians, by the way, some just objectors, some rebels, but there are a lot of them going to be Christians. They're going to be taken out in public, and they're going to be beheaded. Publicly. You know, that's one of the most bloody execution there is, beheading. Their heads are going to be cut off. The blood is going to run in the streets. That's what's going to take place during this period of time. That's the darkness that will overtake the earth. And that, 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 there it is. Go ahead, Brother Greg. I looked when he broke the, the sixth seal, <clears throat> and there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree casts its unripe figs when shaken by, by a great wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Then the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the cave and among the rocks of the mountains. And they, and they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. All right. So when does this take place? We talked about the coming of the Lord, his parousia coming. That's when he comes for his people. We have talk about the rapture. Here's the church age. Here's the tribulation period. The rapture takes mm -hmm. place right here. Now we've got seven years of hell on earth. The first part of it is going to be peace and safety. This is when the guy comes up on the horse. All right? A white horse. Then the white horse changes to the red horse. And the red horse changes to the black horse. Same guy riding all of them. And then the black horse turns into the death horse. Right toward the end of this tribulation period in here, right in here, that's when all of this horrible thing is taking place right there. That's a horrible, horrible period of time that the earth has never known. Not only is the Antichrist, it not only is he killing people, now all of a sudden, the natural forces, the forces of nature are against everyone on the earth. Even the Antichrist, even the people are being uh, uh, shook by the earthquakes. And the earthquakes are so strong. Remember, there was a period of time in, in the world history when the earthquakes, when the earth was shook tremendously. No one could even build a house at that period of time. For maybe hundreds of years, I don't know how long it was. When was that? Test time. When was that? In the days of Peleg, at the Tower of Babel, when God confused the languages, he also divided the continents. And they had built great cities and a great big tower, and the tower was shook down, and the great cities were all leveled out because of the great earthquake of the earth dividing. And however long this took, I don't know. A lot of people were, were, were drowned in that. That's how the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean, that's when all that took, that's when all of those screamed. That's when the African continent and the Asian continents and, and the American continents and the European continents were divided because at one time they were all of God, one of our Pangea, one piece of ground, one earth. And then it became a shaking place. Nobody built any building for a long time. Well, the earth is going to shake again. There was, there was a great preacher preach, and the earth shall shake again. And the earth shall shake again. And this is the time when the earth shall shake again, like it did during the days of Peleg. What it's telling them is the whole world, I'm in control. I'm getting ready to take hold of this. 
I'm getting, I'm just about to put the reins in my hand and bring everything to a close. I'm just about to take the world over because it is mine. What? The days of Peleg. The days of Peleg, yeah. Peleg means divided. If you read back in the book of Genesis there, you'll find out that the days of Peleg, God divided the earth. Yeah, that's right. but I never heard the word Peleg. All right, Peleg means divided. It comes from, uh, the word Pharisee comes from the word Pele also. Pharisee, which means separated or divided. All right? 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 5. Now you've got some background, don't you? I mean, we haven't studied a whole lot of Greek, but you've got background. You know what the Greek says now, what the syntax here is. Pontes. Gar. Emes. Quioi. Photos. Este. Kai. Quion. Hemeros, Uk, Esmen, Niktos, Ude. For all of ye sons of light, ye are. Who's he talking to? Who's Paul the Apostle talking to here? Those that are walking with Christ. The church in Thessalonica. He said, For you are children of light. Who are the children of darkness? The children of the white horse, the children of the red horse, the children of the black horse. The children of the death horse. The children of the Pharisees in Christ's time. The children of darkness in Paul's time. That's who they were. He said, ye are children of light. Are children of light sons of... That word children there? It's weoi. That's heirs of light. Photi, photos. The word Frank comes from this. The word Francis comes from this. The Greek word is photi, or photios, actually. It means, uh, it's a name. It means Frank. And it means feminine is Francis. So anytime you know anybody named Frank or Francis, that means children of light. All right? Children of light? Yes. Child of light. Children of light. Sons of light ye are, and sons heirs of the day. Not we are of night, nor of darkness. Nictos. Our word night comes right out of this nictos right here. N-I-G-H-T, that's basically equivalent to this. Nictos. Who they, nor neither. Skotos. Skotos, that means thick darkness. Okay? Thick darkness. Five and verse six. Bara. Un, me, kathi, domen, pos, hoi, loi poi, ala, gregor, romen, kai, nephomen. All right, here we have another name, another common name. Then, therefore, not. We may sleep. We are, we are not supposed to doze off. We are not supposed to go to sleep. We're supposed to be awake. Don't go to sleep. Let's stay awake. Don't slumber like you're in night, and like it's nighttime. Stay awake. Be alert. Be soldiers on duty. As the ones remaining. But, be Gregory's. There's your word. There's your name, Brother Gregory. Frank was my father's name. <laughs> <laughs> Greg. This word is Greg. This word is Greg. Greg go Roman. There's your name. Greg right there. Gregory. That means watchful one. All right, watchful one. Be ye a Gregory. Be a Greg. Be watchful. Pay attention. Be a child of the light. Now we all saw Frank, and now we saw. Now we see the word Greg. Be watchful. Be alert. And are you learning something? Did you learn what your name means, the line, brother Greg? Yes, I did. Did you know that before? I heard that. Oh, well, I. Yeah. Now you see it in Scripture. 
Gregorman, Gregorman, that we may watch and we may be sober. May Holman, that we may be sober, diligent, alert. Don't be drugged by society. Don't be drugged. Don't be led astray by the desires of the world. Know who you are. Know what God has called you to do. Don't be caught out there doing the wrong thing. Whatever you do, do the right thing. When you wake up in the morning, you know what God wants you to do that day, don't you? Walk in light, not in darkness. Whatever what are the things of darkness? What are the things of darkness? Sin. My sin. What are the sins of the Bible? Lust. Greed. What? Lust. Greed. Envy. Greed. Envy. Strive. Pride. How about gossip? Gossiping. These are all things. Now, these things you know that are wrong. Greed. Let's look at greed for just a minute. The love of money is the root of all evil. It doesn't say money is the root of all evil. Root of all evil. It says the love of money. Why do you think that gambling is so addictive to people? Greed. Greed. Sort of greed. The lust to have something for nothing. Why do you think? People want to be at the top of a pyramid of a great business. Like Nimrod, with lots of little slaves doing all the back laden, back breaking labor below them. Greed. That's what it's been all the way through time, all the way through history. Greed. Greed also, lust, we see the word lust. We can think of that as lust, as sexual desire. Now, God created that in mankind, didn't he? He created it. A man wants to be with a woman. A woman wants to be with a man. That's normal. But it should be within boundaries. God has set down boundaries. Boundaries of love. Boundaries of order. Remember that. For God so loved the world, cosmos. I want you to understand that. So God so loved the order of things. And God has given an order. How his world should exist. And how we should run his world according to his order. Five and verse seven. Hoi. Gar. Tathudotes. Nictos, Kathudose, Kai, Mathis Komenoi, Nictos, Mathusin. All right, we got some methamphetamines in here. Yes, brother. Did, did you miss a word? Did I? After Kai? Kai, Mathus Komenoi. Oh, it's all right. All right. Yeah, it's one word. <laughs> and it says here, for the ones ka thu don't taste. That comes from ka thu day. Ka thu do. That means to sleep. We, we ran into this word over here in verse 6. For the ones sleeping. Now this is present participle active, nominee plural masculine. These are the actors in this verse. They are sleeping. All right. Sleeping. By night, Niktos, sleeping during the night, they kathu dusen. Kathu dusen. They sleep. Third person plural, present indicative active. They do this continually. And it says, Mathus kolmenoi. Mathus kolmenoi. Or Mathis kolmenoi, actually. 
We got our word methamphetamines from this. What do you do when you get on meth? What do people do? What? They're spaced out. I remember when I got spaced out one time. The doctor spaced me out. I was down there at Providence, uh, St. Joseph Hospital down there in Burbank, California, and I was going to go in for, for a heart uh, procedure. They were going to go into my heart with this thing and look around in my heart. Well, I was, I was un upset about this. I was a little bit anxious, a little nervous about it. They came in there and they gave me a shot of this stuff, and I didn't care when they cut my head off. I was spaced out. I was under in the influence. Messed up. I went in there and they poked a hole in my leg and one in my arteries and one in my heart and they were shooting this guy in my heart and all of a sudden I was sitting there like, you know, like this, looking at my heart on the screen and everything like that. And then I realized when they were putting this guy in there, he was killing my heart. He was hurting really bad. I said, you know something? Doctor, I said, every time you shoot that stuff in my heart, it really hurts real bad. Oh, you're real sensitive to this stuff. Most people don't have that problem. I said, man, it hurts bad. Every time you squirt that stuff in there, it hurts. He goes on there, and then they pull this thing out, and I'm bleeding all over the table. They can't get the thing stopped. So they tie a thing up, and I'm sitting there, ah, da, 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 da. you know, I didn't, it didn't make no difference to me. I didn't have a lick of sense. I was like these druggers. And these alcoholics out there, boy, I mean, God gave you good sense. He didn't mean you to wash it away with booze or drugs. You don't even have the sense to survive when you're on that junk. Not even when you're in the hospital. People get drunk at night time. That's what it says there. They get drunk, being drunk at night. Not only plural masculine, present participle, passive. And this word being drunk, being caused to be drunk by night. They are drunk. They're under the influence. They're medicated to a stupor. Medicated into a stupor. Don't be medicated into a stupor, he says. How did they get medicated into a stupor in this period of time? What happened? Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit about history. In the Roman, big Roman uh, parties they had, you know, alcohol was wine back then. And if it was real sweet wine, it had a lot of sugar in it, it would produce sugar is what produces the alcohol in a drink, in, in, in beer or whatever. It's sugar. That's why it's got so much calories in it. They would go in there, and the alcohol that they had was not very highly alcoholic. It was very, very low alcohol content. They would go in there and they'd sit and they'd drink and they'd drink and they'd drink and they'd drink until they couldn't hold anymore and they'd hold it for about 10 or 15 minutes. What's the first thing that goes into your body when you drink booze? The alcohol goes into your bloodstream. Well, after they got the alcohol and they got buzzed up real good, they'd then go and stick a feather down their throat and they had a vomitorium. They had these things. With, it had a, a hole in it and it went out there and it was piped out and they dumped it in the ocean or in the sewers or whatever and they vomited in this thing until they vomited it all up. And, of course, they were still drunk. So they go drink some more. And they just keep getting drunker and drunker and drunker and drunker. I'll tell you something else. Food counteracts alcohol. While these people were getting drunk, they didn't want to eat anything. No food. Don't give me no food. Just give me more alcohol. Keep me on the stoop. I saw my uncles. Go for weeks without eating. Just drinking, tipping the wine bottle. That's all. Tipping the wine bottles. Go for weeks without her, without eating anything. Because they didn't want to get sober. They wanted to stay drunk. That's what it says here. That's it. Being drunk by night. They just kept on drinking. They wanted to keep on the drunk. They wanted to keep the buzz up. Well, thank you for your endurance of those hard seats. And please remember the prayers that we've had tonight brought before us as a group. And we're going to quit right there. Please.
remember the things we're going to ask about. And Brother Ray Soto, would you please dismiss us in prayer, Brother? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this wonderful teaching of the past hour. And to the subject matter that we cover tonight, how important it is that us believers who understand this, that we can go out and bring this news and this warning to non-believers, such as our duty, according to our Father, to save those who have not been saved. Thank you for this wonderful teacher making this very difficult part of the Bible clear to us. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.